Uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to uh, continue in our study in the, uh, in the book of Genesis. Sister Scholl uh, was telling me, I guess they're having a Christian movie festival in uh, Waterworks yeah. Mall. Uh, there's a number of movies this weekend, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and uh, I guess it's all free. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you would like to look at this, I'll have this up here. There's a list of movies, and uh, there's, of course, a website. Everybody has a website. But, uh, if anybody would like to see this, I'll have this up here on the up here on the platform. Okay. Uh, okay, Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> I'll have this here. I said last week that as we uh, begin our study tonight, we're, we're going to be getting, to, getting into the last section of Genesis. <clears throat> uh, and it's important to remember the, the theme, really, of, of this whole series of studies. What we believe about the beginning is, will determine what we believe about our ending. And we've seen in Genesis the beginnings of a lot of things. And from the stories of Abraham till now, we see God's plan, uh, his, really the beginning of his redemptive plan for mankind. That through Abraham, all the, all the uh, nations of the earth would be blessed. Because it was through Abraham that the Messiah would come. And uh, we've seen how that developed through Abraham and Isaac, the son of promise, and Jacob. The last few weeks we've been talking about Jacob and how his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Tonight we're going to begin the last portion of Genesis. If you read in chapter 37 and starting at verse one, it says this. <clears throat> and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, and the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Now remember when I said throughout the, gen the book of Genesis, when you see that term, these are the generations of, it marks a beginning, a new beginning. And it says, Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brother. Now, it begins right off the, the next portion with the name of Joseph. We know that Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob, the first son of the beloved Rachel. Uh, and we've known the story. We've gone over the story so many times, how Rachel was the one that Jacob really wanted, but he got stuck with Leah first, and then Rachel came. <laughs> Uh, and Rachel was barren, and Leah, God blessed Leah because she was the hated one. Eventually, Rachel bore a son named Joseph. And of course, that was daddy's favorite son, even though he was not the oldest. He was the 11th son. There was another son born to him out of Rachel, who's, uh, if you would read in Genesis 35, and we're not going to turn there, but the story is that Rachel gave birth to a son and died doing so. Rachel named the son Ben Anomi, which means son of my sorrow. But Jacob named, named the son Benjamin, or son of my right hand. And indeed, Joseph and Benjamin, if you read through the, the, the rest of the stories as we will, were Joseph's favorite sons. They were the youngest, but they were his favorite. And needless to say, if you've ever raised kids, you know, remember, mom always liked you best, and the smothers brothers, and, well... Uh, it says that Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpah, his, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, we don't know what that's all about. We don't know exactly what happened. We're not given the details. But the story is that the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah were out tending sheep, and they, something happened, and Joseph went back and told on them. 17-year-old Joseph went back and was a tattletale, okay? He was the whistleblower. Whistleblowers are not, are not uh, popular, okay? Now it says in verse 3, and that just kind of sets the theme, okay? Verse 3, 
Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, we've heard, you know, the coat of many colors. That was a sign of his father's favor. Okay, now remember, another thing that we've seen all through these passages in, in Genesis was the younger being sovereign over the older. Uh, the older serving the younger. Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac being the son of promise, Ishmael was the son of the flesh, and so forth. It seems that God favors the underdog. God favors the one that, that all of other conventions says should be second. God, you know, the, the first will be last and the last will be first, okay? So Joseph was favored by his father, Jacob. And that colored coat, that coat of many colors, we understand in that custom of those times and in the culture of that time, that that was a mark of the birthright. That was a mark of the inheritance. In other words, Jacob was saying and transmitting to his older sons that, you know, Jacob is the one. And really, God had in mind Jacob as being the one we're going to see in a minute. But again, can you just imagine what these 11 or these 10 older brothers felt? You know, who's this? You know, this is Joseph. I mean, if you ever grew up in a family where you were not the favored, or maybe you were the favored, uh, they always seems to be, you know, the baby of the family, okay? Uh, the, the ones, the others don't care for him. So there was, and we've read before in, this, in, in the stories about this family how much turmoil and how much uh, strife was going on between these brothers, and we've read those things. So this was not uh, really a, really that, you know, that it was kind of par for the course for this family because they would fight about everything. And uh, so Joseph was being the favored one. He was to have the preeminence. Uh, but the way there would be a very difficult way, okay? Verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father Joseph loved him more than all his brethren, guess what? They hated him and could not speak peaceably Unto him, things must have been pretty tough for Joseph, especially when he was tattletale. <laughs> he was <laughs> so you know. Here he is, the whistleblower, the favorite son, the youngest son. He should have been last on the on the list, but Jacob essentially put him first on the list. And I would imagine those older brothers, every time they saw that stupid coat of many colors, they probably just <laughs> gritted their teeth and probably had their blood boil. Because here's this younger younger kid, and he's being he's getting all the favors. And the rest of them just have to go out and work. Verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream. Now, I don't know how many people here, you know, some folks are dreamers. You ever know anybody was, and when I talk about a dreamer, I don't mean like a daydreamer, somebody who like floats off and just doesn't pay attention. But there are people, some people have a natural inclination to, to think big, okay, to, to dream things. And all, usually dreamers are usually either misunderstood or uh, they're just not accepted. They're rejected. Because usually their dreams have a tendency to rankle other people that don't have that dream. And if you know, you know, if God ever gives you something, and I've told people this a million times, if God gives you like a, a heart for a ministry, you know, people like say, oh, God gives me a heart for an outreach ministry. I always tell folks, don't expect anybody else to feel about your ministry like you do. It's like, it's like having a baby. You know, if you have a baby, you love your baby. Other people come around and look at the baby and say, oh, we're a cute little baby. Oh. But they don't want to change his diaper, okay? And, and, and they're not really particularly concerned with what college he's going to go to, all right? Your baby is your baby. Other people might appreciate it, love it, and, you know, thank me, be thankful for it, maybe help you with it, maybe, you know, but it's your baby. Well, you know, if you have a dream, it's your dream. You know, I've told folks, you know, if God gives you a vision to, to do a ministry or do a work, you go ahead and do it. And who's going to come along will and who won't, won't. And you just got to do what God gives you to do. And don't expect anybody to be as excited about your job as you are, as your dream as you are, okay? Now, Joseph dreamed a dream. And the, the, the mistake number one, he told his brethren. And they did not. They didn't sit around and say, wow, Joseph, that's a cool dream. Wow, phew. But they hated him even more. And I, you know, God speaks to us in dreams sometimes. We've got to be careful. I've always told folks, if you have a dream and you think it's from God, he'll, he'll interpret it. Yes. 
If God gives you a vision, he'll interpret it. You know, you don't have to go around and say, what do you think this means? Well, you'll get a hundred different opinions from a hundred different people, you know. Uh, but if it comes from God, now it might not come from God. Sometimes dreams come from what you eat before going to bed. Sometimes they come from strife and turmoil going on in your life. I believe God gives us dreams as like kind of an escape hatch, sort of like a, uh, an outlet. You know, when we sleep, we just all that, it's like steam. We just let off steam. I believe that's why we have dreams. But God can speak to us in dreams. And when he does, he's, he's pretty fair and, and uh, faithful to give us the interpretation. Here's the dream, verse 6. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood around about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Uh, Joseph said, Here is my dream. And we know what sheaves are. You know, they would bind them together. Today, they, there's big rolls. They, they have machinery to roll them up, but... You know, in those days, they would bind them by hand and tie them up, and there would be like sheaves in the field. So Joseph said there were, there were all these, these sheaves in the field. My sheaf was bigger than everybody else's, and everybody else just kind of bowed down. Well, that, <laughs> that didn't need a whole lot of interpretation. His brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us, or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. See, they, they didn't need to, you know, have any explanation. That was pretty much self-sufficient. They probably thought, who does this guy think he is? What they didn't understand was God was giving Joseph. He was equipping Joseph for what was to come. He was giving him what he would need to keep him through his difficult time. And of course, if you, I think most of us in here know the story. For 20 years, Joseph was in captivity. Or for maybe not quite that long, but he, was, he got sold into slavery. We're going to read that in a minute. And Joseph had to have something to anchor himself on, just like when we talked about Jacob setting up the monuments and so forth when he was going to Padanaram and on his way back. Okay, so he had this dream. God was giving him a dream. He, he probably could have kept it to himself, and it would have done the job it was supposed to do, but he had to tell his brothers. Verse 9, he dreamed another dream. He didn't learn the first time. And he told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. And his brethren probably said, Here we go again. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. That's, now, that's pretty heavy. When the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowed down to Joseph. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him. Jacob said, do you think that we're going to come and bow down, bow ourselves to you, me and your mother? Of course, it's... Mother was passed away at that time, but just, you know, in, in context. Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow ourselves to thee of the earth? Even Jacob was saying, well, who do you think you are? But then, it says in verse 11, his brothers envied him, but his father observed his sayings. His father sat back and said, well, wait a minute now, you know, maybe there's something to this. Again, none of them had a clue of what was to come. We know the story. But they didn't know the story. Here they are, uh, 11 sons, the 12th one being much, much younger. He kind of didn't come into play yet. But 11 sons, and one of them, the youngest one, that should be at the end of the parade, he's lifting himself up like he's going to be the boss. Well, God had given him these dreams. That's what God had told him. He was just sharing it. He should have kept his mouth shut. But he was just sharing it, okay? It's the grand thing. God was setting up what was going to happen. His redemptive plan, okay, Let's read on. Verse 12. And, their, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph. Interesting that they used the name Israel there instead of Jacob. Okay. Israel, the, the prince of God, said to Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send thee unto them. And he said, Here am I. And he said to him, go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brothers. In other words, he was saying, hey, hey, Joseph, go and check out. Make sure your brothers are like, okay. Because, you know, he blew the whistle on them one time. He figured, well, he'll go and check out. You know, what's, what are these boys doing? Jacob knew what kind, of kid, uh, what kind of kids he had. He said, go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks. 
and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Jacob had no idea. Israel, the prince of God, had no idea that this would be the last time he would see his son for over 20 years. His beloved son, the son of the birthright, the son that he, he blessed with the coat of many colors, it would be the last time he would see him for many, many years. And for many, many years, he would mourn and weep every day because he was going to think his son was dead. You know, I saw, they had, a, I don't know if anybody saw the valley, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, where they had in the editorial, uh, right, right after the, the police officer was shot, and they said, you know, if you say to a police officer, I'll see you tomorrow, hope you, hope you do, you know. You, you never know. When you say goodbye to somebody, it might be the last time you see him. That's kind of a scary thought, and that's a heavy thought, but it's, it's a real thought. You know, that's why Sister Elaine always says, you know, make sure you, you, everybody you love, make sure you tell them you love them. Because you might not get that chance. Jacob, he didn't know. Israel, he didn't know. He just figured, okay, Joseph, go see what's up with the boys and come back and let me know what's going on. He was expecting him to come home. <laughs> so it says, uh, in verse 15, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, looking for his brothers. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. This was, his, this was their brother, their half-brother, the son of their father, Israel. They hated him because he was a dreamer. They hated him because God blessed him with a calling and anointing that they didn't have. So they decided they wanted to kill him. So let's just take him out. You know, l let me tell you something. Joseph is such, as, as we read these stories, I want you to, to understand that I believe that Joseph is a type of Christ, okay? He's a type of Christ in many ways, not in every way, but in many ways. Uh, both were special objects of their father's love. Both were hated by their brethren. Uh, the superior claims of both were rejected by their brethren. The brethren of both conspired against them to kill them. Joseph was in intent and figure slain by his brethren as was Christ. Each became a blessing among the Gentiles and gained a Gentile bride. As Joseph reconciled his brethren to himself and afterward exalted them, so will it be with Christ and his brethren. We see here this picture of here's Joseph looking for his brothers. And his brothers seen him coming and they decided to kill him. Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And when he went to the lost sheep of Israel, they rejected him and they killed him. We're going to see some more parallels as we read on. They saw him afar off, and even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. They hated him so much, and they were so terrified at what God was going to do in his life, they could not stand to see their brother be exalted above themselves. And it's sad to say that so often that happens within the body of Christ. When somebody gets blessed, somebody gets called, somebody, somebody gets a ministry, somebody, so very often people, other people will look and they'll say, why should that person be doing that? Why should that person give, get that gift? Why can't I do that? And, and sometimes we don't literally kill each other, but sometimes with our mouths we kill each other. These brethren, when they saw Joseph coming, they said, we'll take care of him. He got all these dreams. They were dream killers. You ever know anybody that was a dream killer? You know, when, when, when God gives me, sometimes God will give me like an idea and a vision. I don't tell many people. Because most of the time, you know, there are a few people that I will tell because I know they'll listen and they'll say, I'll be praying with you. Some folks, as, you, as soon as you tell them what you think God wants, wants you to do, they'll say, oh, you can never do that. You know, why do you want to do that for? That ain't right. You better, you know, and, and people get this thing where there's some people who are just dream killers. Okay, some people were dream builders and some dream killers, all right? Verse 21. And Reuben, remember him? Reuben heard it. He heard what they were saying. 
And he delivered him out of their hands. Now, Reuben is the oldest brother. Remember? He was the firstborn. The birthright should have been his. He should have had the coat of many colors. Because he was the oldest one. But if you remember about Reuben, what did he do? Remember what he did? He slept with one of his father's, uh, with Bilhah, I believe it was, with one of his father's concubines. He did the soap opera thing, right? And, and he, he slept with one of his father's wives. So, so Jacob kind of discounted him. And when we get to the end of this, when Jacob blesses his children, he, it's such a great passage. And we'll get to that you know, in a few weeks. But Reuben, who, who should have been now, it gives you a little faith in his nature because he should have been the one that should have been up front saying, let's do it because he had the most to lose. He wanted to deliver him out of his hands. He said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Reuben wanted to save Joseph. That was his heart to save Joseph. So they put him in this pit and they must have gone off to do what they were uh, going to do. And, it's, and it says, if, if, you, if you would turn, we're, we're not going to turn there, but in Genesis chapter 42, when, when the brothers are standing before Joseph, and uh, Joseph is like the leader, the second in command in Egypt. Okay, we, again, we know the story. We're jumping ahead. And they didn't recognize Joseph. They didn't know who he was. It was 20 years later. And Joseph was demanding that they bring their, their brother Benjamin to him. And they realized, they, they thought that this, this leader of Egypt was going was to kill him. Reuben, uh, Reuben said, uh, I go, Genesis, I thought I had it on my paper. No, Genesis chapter 42 and 21 says this. I forgot to copy it. This is, this is the, uh, what Reuben said about chapter 42 and 21. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty. Now, again, this is when they're standing in front of Joseph, thinking they're going to lose their lives. We are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us. When Joseph was in that pit, he was begging them. He had anguish in his soul. He was begging them. And we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us? In other words, they recognized, they believed that when they were, they thought they were going to be killed at the hands of this Egyptian leader who was Joseph, and they didn't realize it. They figured they were getting, getting the payback. In verse 22 of Genesis 42, and Reuben answered that and saying, Spake I not, didn't I tell you? Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. Therefore, behold, his blood is required. So we see that looking forward a little, but what happened, we're not given every detail here in Genesis chapter 37, but Reuben was saying, listen, let's not, we can't hurt him. If we hurt him, it's going to come back on us, okay? So that's the, that's the interaction that was going on. Now it says in verse 25, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes, and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brothers, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. Well, that was nice of him. We won't kill him. We'll just sell him into slavery. Okay. He said... Uh, he is our brother in our flesh, and his brethren were content. And there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Verse 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And he returned to his brethren and said, The child is not. Where shall we go? And they took Joseph's coat, and they killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Now, uh, know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. Well, they knew whose coat it was. They took the coat, and they soaked it in blood. I was thinking, what a picture. They didn't understand, and they didn't realize. They had no clue. 
that what God was doing was preparing the way to create for himself a nation. Israel, Jacob, we talked about what he had to go through with Laban to become Israel. Well, what were his sons going to have to go through to become the children of Israel? You know, Israel did not become the covenant nation until after 400 years of slavery in Egypt and after everything that they went through. And why were they in Egypt? Because God sent Joseph there. He didn't give him a first-class ticket. He sent him there as a slave. And what happened? What do we read in this portion of Scripture? That they took Joseph's coat of many colors, the sign of his birthright, and they dipped it in blood. And I was thinking, what a picture of what God did when Adam and Eve sinned. What did he do? He killed an animal, and he covered them with the skins of the animal. And I imagine those skins might have been bloody when they put them on to cover their sin. They took the skin of an animal and dipped it in blood to try to cover their sin of selling their brother into, into captivity. And they took it back to J Jacob. And can you just imagine Jacob's heart, his favorite son. When he, what was he feeling when he saw that coat wrenched in blood? Could you imagine his heart breaking and just this, this tragedy that we just experienced here? Can you imagine the heartbreak of a, of a wife hearing your husband has just been shot? Some of us have heard that kind of news with the loved ones who have passed away. These, these callous brothers who hated their younger brother Joseph took his coat, his beautiful coat of many colors, and they soaked it in blood. And in verse 33, And Jacob, Israel, knew it and said, This is my son's coat. He said, that's my son's coat. I made it for him. I gave it to him. This was the mark of my love for my son. And now it comes back covered with blood. It's my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. And essentially, that's what happened. Even though he wasn't dead, he was virtually dead to Jacob. And the evil of jealousy and envy and hatred and strife that existed amongst his brothers, they devoured Joseph. They, they essentially killed him, as far as Jacob was concerned. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his sons many day, his son many days. I imagine for the rest of his life and for the next 20 years, when Jacob thought every morning he woke up wishing he could see his beloved son Joseph. I, I imagine there was no end to the sadness that he felt. It might have, you know, dulled after a while, but it was always there. And those of you who have lost loved ones, you know what that's like. But, but Jacob was, he, Joseph was his special, his special son. And I wonder the brothers, every day they woke up and they saw their father mourning for his dead son, what he thought was a dead son. I wonder how much worse that was than having to see, see Joseph every day. I wonder if there was any remorse in their hearts over the years. If they ever felt, you know, we, sh we should have never done that. I wonder if there was any repentance. Now, let's read on a little bit more. And all his sons and all his daughters rose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave more unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Now, turn with me over and let's read a little bit. Uh, we have some time tonight. Over in Genesis chapter 39. Chapter 38 is, is like maybe for another time. It's kind of like a Parentheses, but, but look at Genesis chapter 39, and <laughs> starting at verse 1. And we'll just read a little bit here to kind of set things up for uh, next time. 
And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Now, now, now change the scene from a mourning Jacob, a Jacob and Israel who is crying and mourning and refusing to be comforted. He lost his son. Here's this young man, Joseph, who was, who was going about doing what his dad told him to do. I said before that Joseph is one of the people in the Bible that really says nothing bad about, nothing negative about Joseph. He was just doing what his dad told him to do, and he ends up getting thrown in a pit and sold into slavery, dragged down to Egypt. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard in Egypt, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which he brought him down hither. Verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph. Well, God, if you were with Joseph, why did you let him get sold into slavery? You know, God, if you're with me, why am I going through this? See, all through these stories, we find out that for God to get the glory, he has to do things so opposite of what we would do. For God to prepare the way for his people. He told Abraham years before this that his, his people would be slaves for 400 years in a foreign land. He told them this, this was planned out. This wasn't an accident. God knew the actions of these people and he, it was all planned out. Before God could have a nation called Israel, they had to go through some things. Before God can have a people called the people of God, we got to go through some things. Before we can be, the Apostle Paul said, we have this treasure in earth and vessels. That the excellency of the power may not be of us, but might be of him. God had to bring Joseph down to the place of the lowest estate. And he had to do it a couple times. Before Joseph could be exalted to being the second in command over Egypt. And preparing a way for his family. I'll just read on a little bit here. It says in verse 2, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, even as a slave. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Potiphar said, man, i got a deal here. You know, man, I've got, I got somebody to be a slave, and this guy is, God blesses everything he touches. And Joseph found grace in his sight. I thank God that no matter what we're going through, we can find grace. And he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So we see again, Joseph being lifted up, even as a slave, he became the chief servant of Potiphar's house. And he became exalted above all the other servants. Do you think that made some of them servants upset? And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. When, when somebody is in the center of God's will, blessing follows them. Everything they touch is blessed. If they're hearing from God, if they're doing what God wants them to do, you know, nowhere in this, in this passage do we read where Joseph said, God, why are you letting me go through this? Maybe he did, I don't know. It doesn't, but it doesn't tell us. I don't think Joseph just sat back and said, oh, well, I'm a slave, you know, sold me a slavery. I'm sure he had some questions in his mind. He was human like anybody else. He remembered that dream that God had him about the sheaves bound down, and he's probably thinking, God, how are you going to do this? He, he was in a position that he did not apply for, but God blessed him. God blessed him. Now, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She started checking him out. Okay. <laughs> things haven't changed, all right? I mean, I, you know, I don't care. Things just don't change. And she said, lie with me. Come on, Joseph. Part of far is away, you know. Nobody will know. Come on. It reminds me over in Proverbs when they talk about the, the loud woman, you know, and, and the fool that goes through the street and the woman says, Come, my husband is away. He won't be back for weeks and I've, I've got the place ready. Come on, you know. She 
She said, lie with me. But Joseph refused. He refused. He said unto her, My master wants not what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. He trusts me with everything. There is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee. Because you are his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph had, so thank you, scruples. Is that, a, is, that, is, that, is that like a foreign word nowadays? Scruples? Morals? Uh, you know, a commitment to purity? You know, it just lets us know that things aren't different today. You know, they had the same stuff going on. And, and just as Joseph determined he would not sin against his God, he could have got away with it. He could have started something. And nobody would have known. But he determined, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm, God has blessed me. You're, uh, my master, Potiphar, has made me chief over everything. He's entrusted this with, with me. He, he, wanted, he had responsibility and accountability. He says, I'm not going to go against my master, Potiphar. Look what he's trusted me with. I, I, how, boy, if everybody had that kind of attitude, would we be in the state that we're in today? Few people have that attitude. I think, uh, I don't want to get too, I don't want to get political or nothing, but just recently, uh, they had a birthday party for our ex-president, Bill Clinton. Okay. Uh, not, not one of my favorites. Okay. Maybe he was one of yours. That's okay. But, and they, they had a big presentation on, uh, I guess I showed it on Yahoo. I did not watch. And they had all these uh, performers, and they called it a decade of difference. Nah, that's not what it was. <laughs> maybe a decade of decadence, maybe. <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> well, you might have made some money, but he was a wh he was a whoremonger. Yeah, he was a whoremonger. Hey, here's here's what I'm saying. Excuse me, but I'm preaching. Okay, here's what I'm saying. He was he was he was a whoremonger. And what I'm saying is, why doesn't, why doesn't America care about the people they elect to office and their, and their, uh, their honesty and their honesty? Why don't people care about that? We make a joke out of uh, sexual impurity, but Joseph was pure. He expects us to be pure, too. And, we, and, and we, we, make, we, we, we call it frivolous when, you know, uh, you know he's, he, the President of the United States has a sexual affair in the, in the Oval Office. And we laugh about it. Whatever happened to purity? Whatever happened to, to, to concern about what God thinks? Listen to what he says. He says, there's none greater in this house, house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Verse 10. And it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he hearkened. He kept, she kept pounding on him. She kept working on him. You know, she kept trying to break him down. But he would not be broken down. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house and said, See? She accused him of trying to have sexual intercourse with her. He's brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment until the Lord came home, and she spoke unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto me came in unto mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, but she spoke, after this manner did this servant do unto me. His wrath was kindled. 
And Joseph, once again, he went from being up here to down here. Again, next week, we'll pick it up there. Because Joseph finds himself in prison. He took him into prison in verse 20, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Verse 21, but the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. He was with him when he was in the pit. He was with him when he was sold into slavery. He was with him when he was sent into prison. Again, he didn't do anything wrong. He was falsely accused, slandered. But the Lord was with him. And what did he do? The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. There he, there he is again, being lifted up, put down and lifted up, put down. He can't keep Joseph down. Why? Because he sold out to God. And God had a purpose for his life. It took being sold into slavery. It took being put into prison. But we're going to find out next week that all that was just a path to where he needed to be to be ready for, yes. to prepare a place for his brothers that sold him into slavery. And a picture of Christ, a picture of Christ, that when that time came, that his brothers came down because they were starving. Joseph forgave them. What a picture of Christ, yes. this Joseph. Mm -hmm. Being sold into slavery, being essentially killed by his brethren, being falsely accused and thrown into prison, and rising up again to be the second in command in the nation of Israel. It says... And we'll just close out this chapter. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under the hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made to prosper. Even in prison. I wonder if there was any time when Joseph said to the Lord, God, when are you going to get me out of this prison? You know, it doesn't tell us that he did, but he was human. I wonder if there was ever a time when he said, God, when are you going to get me out of this prison? But he waited. And we know that God made a way. God made a way. I want to pray and uh, whatever we go through, whatever we struggle with, God has a purpose. If we're in the center of his will, now here's the problem. Here's the thing. Sometimes we think we're in the center of his will, but we haven't taken the time to stop to look around. There, there, there are people today who think the center of his will is, you know, economic uh, blessings. And God, and that, God can bless us economically. There's some folks that think the center of his will is power. And that can be, you know, God can give us power and authority. But wherever it is, you know, before we can get to the mountaintop, we've got to go through the valley. Before Joseph could get to the, the second highest in Egypt, he had to go through the slavery. He had to go through the prison. What are we going to have to go through to get to where God wants us to be? And are we willing? And are we willing to whatever we're going to go through, to, are we willing to be, say, okay, God, you know, here I am. What are you going to do with this? How are you going to use me with this? I just want to pray and uh, seek the Lord's face tonight. Father, we, we're living in perilous times. And Lord, I know that many of us are going through things. Father, my prayer this evening is that you would help us be in the center of your will. That you would help us, Lord, uh, Keep our eyes fixed upon you. That whatever we're going with, we're going to realize, Father, that you have a plan. That you have a purpose for us, Lord. I'm sure that Joseph had no idea 
that someday you would use him to prepare a place for his family. Uh, he probably thought he would never see his dad again. And I'm sure Jacob thought he would never see his son again. Father, there might be things in our lives that we feel are dead and gone. Things that we once thought were important and things that we once cherished. Things that we feel that maybe have died and gone on. But Lord, you're able to do all things. Father, I pray that you would bring restoration and healing, Father, in our lives. That, Father, whatever prison we're in, whatever, whatever we're dealing with right now, Father, we know that you have a purpose. If we're in your will and we're your children, you have an ultimate purpose. You want to conform us to the image of your son, first of all. That's the main thing. But, Lord, there's a purpose. You, you're going to use us to prepare a place. You're going to use us, Lord, to open up doors that nobody else can open. Father, your redemptive plan, we yield to it this evening, Father, whatever it might be. Father, we allow, I ask you to allow us just to experience your grace, Father. That as we ask for discernment to be in the center of your will, Lord, you will show us. You will show us your perfect will, Father. It says that if we present our bodies a living sacrifice to you, holy and acceptable, it's our reasonable service, and we'll know what is that good and perfect will, acceptable will of the Lord. Father, I pray, God, that we present ourselves to you this evening to know what is that good and perfect and acceptable will. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. Anybody have any comments or questions? Or